Hey, you're listening to Abyss Gazing, a horror podcast where we celebrate all things spooky and mental health. I'm your co-host, Mark. And I am your co-host, Josh. And we are joined by a a friend of mine, which it's it's been a while that uh, since I've had a, a friend on this podcast. And uh, he is one of the hosts of the Systematic Geekology podcast, Mr. Joe Dia. What's up, my friend? What's up? Thanks for having me on. Well, uh, thanks for being here, man. I got to do your show a couple. Uh, it feels weird to say a couple of months ago, but it, it has been that long. Yeah, it's wild to think that it was it was that long ago, especially because we were talking about uh, spooky movies even then. Yeah. Well, I mean, in all um, fairness, me and Josh are always talking about spooky movies. Yeah. So. <laughs> It's always good to like add more friends to those conversations that you can kind of talk about because like uh, Joe's recently been like checking out movies that like we've already done episodes on in the past. So like he just recently saw Nope for the first time. Yeah. It's like we're just kind of going back and like examining Nope and we're just like he's like, man, he's like, I like having another friend to like talk about this stuff with. And I'm like, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's always cool to like add those those uh, numbers to uh, to to, you know, your community. Yeah, it's it's great to be on a show that that celebrates this kind of thing. It's funny because for the last year, Systematic Ecology just uh, crossed the one year mark. And there have been a couple of times along the way where my co-hosts have been gracious enough to give me a platform to talk about horror related stuff when the rest of the audience is like, what what about Marvel? Where's the Marvel content? You know what I mean? But. Yeah, so Mark, uh, Mark and I, we had originally started uh, talking about horror on the Victims and Villains podcast, and it got to a point where a lot of our listenership ended up like liking the horror stuff more. So it's like, Mark, we should probably just start a separate podcast. Um, and I was just kind of like, yeah, okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like with podcasts, that's how normal people talk about like people with tattoos, how people with tattoos talk about tattoos. They're like you get the first one and then you're addicted. That's how I feel about podcasting, man. You start one and one turns into two, turns into half your time spent in front of a microphone. I mean, in all fairness, in my case, I ended up part of the like crew because I just didn't <laughs> go away. <laughs> it just kind of kept coming around. I was like, what are y'all doing? And it's like, oh, we need somebody else for this podcast. And I was like, sweet, I'm free. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it Mark this. and I, be yeah, Mark and I became accidental friends. Um, cause he did, a he did an episode, uh, like back in 2017. It was 28, 2017, 2018, something like that. Completely random. I didn't talk to him. We didn't talk for like an entire year. And then, um, just, we just happened to like cross paths again. And then he just, I never shook him. And <laughs> I I joke around that. It's like, uh, Mark's a great, uh, co-host to have because, uh, we see the world from two different vantage points. And I love having conversations like that. Cause I feel like it makes for a richer podcast listening experience. Yeah. Yeah. The, the biggest thing we keep hearing is it just sounds like, friends having conversations even from guests too so no just chilling We're all and friends, a conversation yeah. <laughs> well uh the, before we get into the movie for this episode uh tell us a little bit about what systematic ecology is all about uh so we are uh, a bunch of christians who came together and realized we all have passions we all have fandoms things that we geek out about and that's okay and so we started um, producing content centered around this idea that if you look at our fandoms, right, you, it, they all the best ones force us to think about things. They force us to ask questions. And as one of our uh, one of our panelists says, hold the mirror up. And it was it's born out of this idea that, you know, you can you can show people. Let's try that. Cool. Um, you can show people that that you know it it is in fact okay 
to be a Christian and like things like Star Wars or like things like Marvel or horror or something like that and celebrate the asking deeper questions and allowing those deeper themes to come out. And what makes it interesting is he is Josh kind of serves that role between the two of us. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> <laughs> like I was waiting for first, you to say something like that. <laughs> well, our first episode that we did for Abyss Casing was the original Christopher Lee Wicker Man. Oh, so it was Ghoulies. And, sorry, and, uh, second episode. Bay would be so upset if she heard you say that. I have a bad memory. Don't blame me. Uh, but yeah, our second episode there was uh, the original Wicker Man. And it was, we had the different conversation from different views of him kind of giving the Christian aspect of viewing it and me a much more open and secular one. Right. It's funny because even between us, us over at at SG, there's, I, I tend to, while I'm not afraid to sermonize and I mean, for crying out loud, I'm, I'm in the process of training to become a pastor, but I spent up until five years ago, that whole time I spent, I spent many of those years in, in sex, drugs and rock and roll, the world, all of that kind of stuff. I by no means grew up in the church. And so to me, that's when some of the best conversation and, and when it's when it's pure, unadulterated conversation. But that's when some of the best conversation can come out when when you're unafraid to hit these different things, whether it's horror movies or comic book stuff or a TV show or whatever from those different viewpoints and allow for the open dialogue to take place. That's one of the reasons that I I. I... I like podcasting because like you had said, like it's, it is like this open dialogue type of thing. And uh, it, you know, it's, it feels really interesting to take this movie and follow it up with from our last episode, which was Bram Stoker's Dracula, where mm-hmm. it wove so much uh, of like, you know, religious undertones. And so like, we ended up like getting to talk about like, you know, the Bible and church and stuff like that. And, then, like, as I was watching this movie last night in preparation for this episode, by the way, we're covering 1931's Frankenstein, uh, which is not only the oldest movie that uh, we have ever covered on Abyss Gazing, but it's also the oldest movie we've ever covered in the history of Victims and Villains. So it's super exciting. Uh, I have been pushing for us to cover a foundational horror film for months. Mark can tell you. Um, it's not so much been pushing; it's been trying to get it worked into the schedule and figure out which one we were going to watch. That's fair because we also did that with uh, Event Horizon too, where we would be like, eh, "We should we, this would be a great movie," and then like it just it kind of gets glossed over for something else, right? And but we uh, for, got it. Yeah, we finally got it. So go check out that episode. Uh, it's really interesting because like I, I feel like this movie, you know, just kind of getting right into it jumps into a lot of like the things that I feel like we as like humans, like we struggle with um, very, very fervently where it's like the, you know, the aspect of like immortality, but also at the same time, like the aspect of what is the greater power? Like, like who is, is out there. So Frankenstein, I watch it with my wife. You've met her. You know how she is. Indeed, she, I do. She made the comment about it being more of a social commentary than people realize with it being God creates man, man kills God, man thinks he's God, man creates monster, monster kills man. Right. So. If I can, I have the the monologue that I want to read real quick um, that Dr. Also... Frankenstein in this movie is the dot refers to the doctor and not necessarily the monster as so much of pop culture likes you to believe. So it's really Franken- jarring. Frankenstein yeah. in any iteration refers to the doctor. Right. Yes. But it's very jarring. Like watching this movie, like 
I don't know about you guys before I read this uh, and maybe this is a sidetrack, but like I grew up that like the monster was Frankenstein. It's always what I've been told growing up. And so like when I sat down to watch this movie for the first time as an adult, like it was, it was a, such a jarring experience. Cause I hadn't seen like any other like versions successfully do this where it's like, anytime they would be talking to the, to the doctor, I'd be like, okay, it's not the monster. It's the, it's the doctor. It's, it's not the monster. It's the doctor. It's a very weird experience to like watch this movie being told one thing from culture and experiencing another thing from the source. Well, look at all the promotional material for it. It's a oh, picture yeah. of the monster with the title Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Yeah. Universal did not care about making that distinction in any way, <laughs> shape or form. I, I, in, in high school, I was a part of, um, theater and so i was i was with all of the pretentious actor kids that that would make those kinds of distinctions like you know no franken frankenstein and then you had your select group that would uh correct you on the pronunciation because frankenstein is a very american way of pronouncing that name but yeah i i I've always been the one that's that's known enough to correct other people. So it's interesting to hear you say that 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 you grew up with that with that idea that it was the the monster. But you think about it, most of especially in the 90s, most of the stuff that was out there would anything having to do with you an adaptation of Universal Monsters, the monster is Frankenstein, just straight across the board. Yeah, a a every single time. So like um I've only seen this movie a handful of times, but like every time I I watch it like it it amazes me, but like I also still find myself being like having to correct no, it's it's the doctor. Um but uh Dr. Frankenstein uh reads this and um just kind of the quote. Have you ever not wanted to do anything that was dangerous or you shoe where should we be if no one tried to find out what lies but beyond? Have you never wanted to look beyond the clouds and the stars or to know what causes the trees to bud and what challenges the darkness into light? Sorry, changes the darkness into light. But what if you talk like that to people, people call you crazy? Well, if I could discover just one of those things, what eternity is, for example, I wouldn't care if they do think i was crazy end quote and i think it's fascinating because i feel like that one monologue kind of like summarizes like his entire character journey throughout this entire film where he's essentially attempting to 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 play god uh for lack of a better word and, and kind of create this this um this monster for for lack of better words it is kind of known throughout culture now yeah, I, so I watched the the movie today in in prep for this, and I've I, it had been oh, this is the first time that I watched it as a Christian, so it's been at least five years since I've seen since I've seen the movie, and it was interesting because before being a Christian, I was a transhumanist, and so this idea of immortality or piercing the veil or something along those lines is something that has been resonant with me for for some time and you can see those themes obviously all over the place in in this um in this movie and it, it lends it lends itself to one of the one of my favorite aspects of any of the universal monster flicks that that they're telling us a, a a relatable character story centered around whatever the monster is and with this, you can see it through the lens of the actual monster, the actual lumbering monster, but also through the lens of Dr. Frankenstein also sharing some of that spotlight as the monster. Yeah, and, and everything comes down to misunderstanding and underestimation. So the monster under, uh, underestimated his own strength and abilities while everybody else kind of misunderstood what he was. And the same goes for um, 
Dr. Frankenstein, they kind of almost underestimated what he was doing and his ability to do it, while others, when the monster was essentially rampaging because he didn't know any better, for all intents and purposes, he was a toddler and didn't know any better with some of the stuff he did. And they took pity on Frankenstein for, oh, this is what ended up happening. We're sorry this happened with your experiments, but you've done this great thing by creating life. I, I'm probably going to uh, show my age here a little bit, but uh, there's a, I think I'm the youngest on this call before I say that. So there's a, there's a scene from Spy Kids 2 where <laughs> I'm going somewhere with this. Hang on. Um, I know it sounds weird to talk about it on a horror podcast, but you know I'm going somewhere with it. Uh, there's a there's this there's a quote from Spike Hits too, where Steve Gutenberg says, "Do you ever think that God looks down at his own creation and is afraid of it, what he has created?" And I love that that line is for as goofy as it is, is applicable to this movie. Because there comes a point to where like Dr. F uh, Dr. Frankenstein's Frankenstein is actually uh, like terrified of the the creation which he has created because he essentially, you know, he wants to go off and marry his fiance, start his life, realize, you know, hey, I made a mistake. I need to move on and ultimately kind of doesn't go that way. And I think it's just uh, I I couldn't stop thinking about that last that line last night, um, but it's interesting to me, you know, when you see uh, another movie that comes to mind is Pet Cemetery, where you have like the idea of like playing God, but then it's like that kind of like genie twist where you get like a a really like demented like demonic version of that source that you put in there, whether it's the cat, um, you know, the child, depending on which version you're talking about. And then in the end, the wife. It's interesting when, when you look at this movie and, you know, you've got the famous scene, you know, it's alive. And it's, it's actually funny. The first time I ever saw that scene was actually not in the movie itself. It was in a clip for that it was it was shown for oh i don't know 10 seconds in the first scream movie and i'm like what is this like it it caught my attention and that's what actually get, uh, the the first time that i ever watched it but it's so it's it's so famous in the sense of like some people have seen that and know that See that theme of it first and foremost of this doctor in this mad in this mad creation before knowing anything else about the film or anything like that like it's one of those movies like pulp fiction or the matrix or star wars where the more of what more of what they're about can be felt in the reverberations than the people who have actually seen the film itself well it's one of the like original classics so <clears throat> excuse me it's like seeing Bella Lugosi as Dracula it's it's you know what it is without knowing what it is it's just one of those iconic scenes you see two seconds of it five seconds of it and you know what it's from because it's just that well known yeah, I probably had a similar experience with this movie uh, that like Joe had like I had, before I'd ever seen this movie, like I'd seen it in like another movie, whether it was Scream or um, something else entirely to where like I, I can't remember the first time I heard it. But it is it's that scenes that those two words, it's alive. You know, I feel like even if you've never, never seen this movie, I guarantee you've at least heard that audio clip mm -hmm. and what I think this movie does uh, really well is because I, I, and I feel like too, like we've, I don't want to say necessarily satirized it as like uh, in it's nearly hundred, almost hundred years uh, since its creation. But I feel like we've done this 
disservice to this film to where like um you know like what kate was saying uh mark that this movie is a social commentary it speaks volumes on so many different things but also at the same time like it's this it's this monster movie but yet you know following in the the tradition of bram stoker's dracula it's also got these like elements of like romance into it and i i think that it's it balances everything so well in such a, a tight space that it you know whether you're a fan of horror or not i feel like this is like viewing that everyone should see at least once simply because it is a not as you said mark it's a classic it's it's mm -hmm. a foundational uh film that dips into multiple different genres but also at the same time like it it has this timeless quality about it that i feel like you don't get with a whole lot of modern cinema well, they also did in Hollywood with this what like Disney did with a lot of the Grimm's fairy tales. <clears throat> like they they made a more fairy tale like instead of what the actual story was. So, like in the book, the monster comes back and kills Frankenstein. So in the nineties, they did a um, I guess a remake, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with De Niro. Uh, is the monster oh yeah and it's an excellent adaption of the book too never never even <laughs> never knew that was a thing but you know it's it's, it's following actually, the success of bram good, stroker's dracula not surprised it's a good it's a good interpretation of the book so the the 1931 interpretation was kind of simplified almost from the original book um bringing in that the whole, like I said, men kills God, creates monster, monster kills men. And it takes place more like that in the book and in the, the 90s version and maybe some other lesser known versions. If you or someone you know is listening to this podcast right now and you're struggling with suicide, addiction, self-harm, or depression, we encourage you guys to please reach out. This is the heartbeat of why we do what we do. Suicide is currently the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. And as of this recording, there are 132 suicides that take place each and every day on American soil. And when you scale back internationally, there are 800,000 successful suicides. That is one death roughly every 40 seconds. So if you or someone you know is struggling, you guys can go to victimsandvillains.net forward slash hope. That resource is going to be right in the description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this. There you'll find resources that include the National Suicide Lifeline, which is 1-800-273-8255. You can also text HELP to 741-741. We also have a plethora of other resources, including churches, getting connected with counselors, LGBT resources like the Trevor Project, and also Veteran Hotline as well. Please, if you hear nothing else in the show, understand that you, yes, you listening to this right now, have value and worth. We get it. Suicide, depression, mental health, these are hard topics, and the stigma around them doesn't make it any easier. But please, consider the resources right in the descriptions below, wherever you guys are listening, because... Once again, you have value and you have worth. So please stay with us. But I think I think at that at that note, that boiled down version, because you're right, and it's the same deal with a lot of the <clears throat> the universal monster movies, that a lot of them are character arcs or storylines or story beats that are distilled down and presented very linearly in, in a way that is very, takes a very philosophical approach because phil philosophy is written in a way where a lot of different things can be drawn from it and it will stick with a lot of different people for various reasons. And it's the same thing with something, with, with something like this. And I think when you have something 
like this that doesn't have the opportunity to get bogged down in the frills of it all that is that is forced to tell a a almost um stage like performance where you know you you almost get the feel like you are watching a play in a sense then you you have this opportunity to very bare bones tell stories about some things that whichever layer you're looking at, we can look back to centuries of people that have wrestled with some of these very same things from looking at it from the point of view of man trying to play God, as well as from the level of man trying to tear God down. Yeah. I think too, like uh, you know, just not to not to play the devil's advocate here, but I think some of it too also comes down to uh, just limitations of the era. Um, you know, I think at this point, what movies had basically been around like twenty years, like the the art of of filmmaking. You know, we had we had gone from you know the the uh, the silent film era to the to the talkies. And so that you're still you're still down. But I, I think that you bring up a good point, Joe, where you talk about like the the themes and, and just how they're they're t- they're timeless, because, you know, before films even existed, you can go back and you look at stories. Um, and I think it's even not just what we know here in America, but different cultures that have those stories where man creates uh, God creates man. And then likewise, you have man trying to create, uh, you know, try to tear God down or create his own life and, and try to understand the things that are uh, beyond us that we all want the answers to. I, I think all three of us here in this, on this call, we have very different vantage points when it comes to uh, how we grew up versus how we are now and how some of that has dictated the experiences we've gone along the way has dictated, you know, I've talked about it before in the podcast, but like, you know, I lost a friend to suicide. This is the reason why I'm a mental health advocate, but it's also the reason why I'm a Christian because I kind of got placed with this like uh very definitive, like mortality rate, a very early in my my adult life and it it made me question a lot of things and kind of like poised it and then um mark has kind of shared in the past about his own experience like being raised in the church and then asking those questions and walking away and then joe you shared it earlier where like you've only been a christian for you know the last five years so you have a completely different story than than either of us and it's kind of like a, a reverse almost but at the center of that is like all of these stories, like God is interplayed into them all or a higher power or whatever you want to, to call it that like, you know, I think that there's something within us that we're always kind of searching and begging that question. What is after all of this? Yeah. I mean, when you boil it down, really what religion is, is man trying to understand the world around it from the time that people thought that the, the natural elements were, were acts of God uh, on, on through to modern, modern day, you know? And, and I think that as long as humans have been aware that the, the carbon based life form has an expiration date, that we've always been trying to negotiate our way away around that, you know, and, and trying to figure out things like immortality, trying to figure out things like what, what is this life about or what comes after this life or whatever version. And then from that point, you get into the actual specifics of, of religion and, and so on and so forth. But when you boil it down Those are some of the very things that change people's lives that totally alter the course of things. And, and sometimes for the better, sometimes for the worse, you know, and, and especially if you are exposed to that, the younger you're exposed to that, 
I think the bigger the bigger impact those questions are going to have on you as an individual. And so something like this gets the benefit of being a product of its time. Like you're saying, I've abs- absolutely like we're talking about 1931. You have to present this like a play, essentially, because that's that's that you don't have the power of special effects and this and that to be able to add to the experience. And so you have to tell a story. You have to tell a story using what you have in front of you. So why not tell a story about a thing that is a version of something that has been that that, like I said, people have been asking for time and memoriam. Well, even if you look at the way it was produced, the scenes were shot in the manner that it was essentially we're recording uh, a play stage because you can make out the the painted, the hand painted backdrops. You can see the wave and the curtain and things like that. So it was essentially just a a soundstage for a play. So that's what they had to work with. There was very few scenes that appeared to be taped for lack of a better phrase, in the wild. It was all done on sound stages and you could see the props and you could tell it was a painted background. So it does come across as that play feeling more so than a major theatrical release, like something we would get now. Granted, back then it was a major theatrical release, but it doesn't have that same feeling that it, it did then now. Can I take a quick pit stop on uh, on what you just said, Mark? That's one of the things that I love the most about this movie because I'm the type of guy that I'll watch old Godzilla and watch for the strings and that that sort of thing. Like, there's just a special part in my heart for the fact that, yeah, 100, you can tell the painted props and the curtain waves and all of those little imperfections, but it adds to the overall experience as you're watching this film and it adds to the character of the movie yeah and shows more of the artistic value that was put into it at the time than just throwing up a computer generated green screen yeah i i think it's like movies like this that when you look at the production because there there's a a very particular scene where people are like running into like a distance and then like the camera cuts and it's uh but like you could tell that like they are running into like a a stage like prop and yeah. uh it's it's very noticeable but like when i watch movies like this i feel like it's it's movies like this that give me the appreciation for uh the movies that we cover uh, that are independent in film festivals and even in our own film festival uh, you know, I loved seeing how creative people can be with a budget. I love the like Ryan Reynolds when he was like doing uh, press for the first Deadpool. We talked about like having such a limited budget of uh, 55 million when we're in an era of comic book movies getting 150 to, to 300 million. He's like, yeah, it just meant we had to be more creative. And I feel like the I feel like movies are better uh produced when you have a smaller budget because of that it basically means that you have to show off your own skills well the funny part just little worthless piece of knowledge the most expensive prop on that set of deadpool one was the br arthur t-shirt yes it was it was like a ten thousand dollar t-shirt because he had to pay for the rights for it huh yeah. But something else from that same time period, if you talking about movies that question like life and afterlife and things like that, uh, Max Van Sydow did one back in the same time period. Um, believe it was called the Seventh Seal, I believe. Um, yeah, I know. He was about. a crusader playing chess with death over the life of some pilgrims. It's an interesting movie talking about the along the same life, talking about afterlife, life and death and things like that. Right. Well, like, let's talk about like the life of this movie real quick, Um, because I I feel like there's so that so the setup is like this film opens up on a funeral and it opens up on a funeral because Dr. Henry Frankenstein and 
his lab assistant, Igor, is uh, basically, like, going to, like, rob the grave and, like, that recently deceased body is going to become the monster. And so there's a scene later on where they are trying to steal a brain for the monster and there's a normal brain which is a very like highly sophisticated uh you know member of society and then the abnormal brain which is classified in this film as a a criminal brain um and i think that like they're like oh yeah well this is gonna like and then the rest of the movie once he finds out like it's that one act just kind of like defines him for the remainder of his his life. And, and you kind of see like they 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 feed into that trade a little bit um with some of the some of the things that they have the monster do. But I just kind of thought it was fascinating when you're talking <laughs> ab- about um mental health of this movie that you know I don't would ever I don't, would never say that like one person one person is like defined by like one thing. Like you guys can't see this because this is this is a video podcast, but like uh Joe behind him has the Joker and Stab uh from the screen movies behind it. And then in my my background, Mark Mark is recording in his kitchen. So uh <laughs> my background is is Hellraiser and Freddy versus Jason. Um and then Nightmare Alley and the X Files right next to it. But like Again, like those are things that like I like, but I would never say that like there's one single thing that like defined me. And I think it's really uh, interesting that like for this time period that you have something like as simple as a brain that literally defines your entire actions and, and personality. This is also during a time where you know you you look at some of the some of the explanations for why different things happened with people why people acted different ways why you had criminals all of those kinds of things and some of the ridiculous um thought processes and theories that are raised about the damage of a brain you know it becomes very easy to to talk about in a in a almost satirical kind of way when you think about it but then you turn around and you think about how certain things are thought about today and how certain things are processed t- today and i think we still struggle with i think it's still very evident that we struggle with things like what makes up an identity what makes up an individual why do people do the things that they do and and then from there throwing on labels like criminal or dysfunctional or something like that. Well, even when you get into the psychology aspects of it, psychology is kind of where we're at now is somewhat new and underdeveloped as opposed to other branches of science. So like they didn't start getting into studying the serial killers to what the 70s is when the term finally came around yeah and they started finding that it people could be like psychopaths sociopaths things like that but not turn in to be these horrible human beings and killers and mass murderers so then you get into something like this and he's very clearly making questionable decisions, <laughs> creating the monster from dead people. And they're all like, oh, well, he's doing it. Good for him. Where now, if you were to try to do the same thing, <laughs> you'd be insane and put it in a mental institution. So it's uh, it's also kind of an, uh, a, a statement on the lack of knowledge at the time, too. I, I think even today, like there's a lack of, of knowledge that that yeah. takes place because uh, one of the things that, you know, Joe, you brought up is that like we have this it's almost kind of this like cultural practice now that when you meet somebody, the very first thing is like, what do you do? Yep. Like, like that's always like an identity, an identity thing and like a, an icebreaker, which is like I would never I 
I well, manage a small also, business. That's also kind of a cultural thing too. You go to other yeah. countries and other countries aren't like that. Yeah, like I, I manage a, a small business and I podcast. Like I would never say that that's, that's who I am as like my identity. Like that's not what I would say one bit because, you know, an identity is something that I feel like it goes with you wherever you go. And like, you know, I podcast from, you know, seven to, to eight. But once, you know, that podcast ends, I go on to the next thing. You know, I would say that I, I'm, you know, even being a cinephile, like that movie is eventually going to end and I'm going to keep going on with the rest of my life. Um, but, you know, I think it's then you get into uh, some of the things that you were talking about, Mark, you know. Um, and one of the things, too, that I think this movie highlights really well is that, like, here you have a character that believed he was the hero of this story. And uh, I think that's a, that's always a fascinating character decision to explore, but also at the same time, here you have everyone around him that like here, he had a guy that had these like the best of intentions, but people didn't understand it. People didn't want to take time to understand it. So he was just kind of written off as crazy. And I think it's a, an important reminder that, we fear what we don't understand and we never make time to understand. That identity piece has always been so fascinating to me because I spent over a decade in an industry that demanded that if you, your, your identity was intrinsically tied to the title. I spent many years as a chef and I, I didn't, I didn't go to culinary school. I went through, and work my way up the ladder. And uh, a lot of people talk about the restaurant business in the same way that you hear a lot of athletes talk about it, talk about different things, especially combat, uh, combat athletes. You know, you hear them say, if, if you're not in it to be champion, then what are you in it for? Same thing with the restaurant business. If you're not in it to be chef, then, then get out of the industry. You know what I mean? It's, it's just that simple, but when you, when you hit that title, of chef that that is your identity that becomes that 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 is tied to who you are now i have a different perspective on it now that i'm a christian but if there's nothing if there if there's no other thing that's tethering your your sense of identity then it is subject to whatever the individual's passions are, whatever the individual sees themselves as. And then when you throw on that anything with, with a brain that does not fire on all cylinders or, or any kind of issue that influences how a person sees themselves, then all bets are off as far as trying to really make heads or tails of what an individual's identity is. You know, at this stage of my life, I am even 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 on to the weightier titles that uh, that I hold. You know, it, it it's still any one particular thing is not the sum total of my identity. My identity now at this stage of my life is in Christ, but before that, it was in whatever I wanted it to be in. You know what I mean? And and that's just, you know, so so to me, it's fascinating whenever you can start to ask those questions, because it really does. If if you allow yourself to really ask, what do I wrap my identity up in without coming to it with with a, with a canned answer or or something that's holding you back from really exercising the question? then it gives, it allows for that mirror to be held up to say, okay, what is it that I really put myself into? What is it that I put my, that I tie myself to at that deep of a level? What well, I think to like also to do like to, to kind of jump off that. I, I also feel like we don't, as a culture, we don't ever ask that question of like, what is my identity? Like, I'd never heard that question until I became a Christian until I be started like 
actually breaking down and like reading scripture and reading books like Ephesians, Galatians, uh, Romans, all of these things that, you know, are tied up into, you know, who I am when I am found in God. And then you like talk to people that aren't in the church and don't have that experience. And it, it's an, it feels like a, like a cultural shock to, to kind of have those conversations. I think, you know, you are what you are, are passionate about. Um, you know, you are what you make time for. Like, I would say like outside of that, like, I would say that my identity is probably like a husband. Like that's, you know, that's something that like I enjoy doing and enjoy being. And I am very passionate about my wife. And so like, but also at the same time, like, you know, you have to clearly define what your identity is because if you are millions of other things that everyone wants you to be, then that is going to take its toll on your mental health. Yep. Oh, with me, it's everything is an aspect of who I am. Does it make up what I am? so to speak. So as a career, I work on copiers and software and stuff, but that doesn't make up who I am. That's just what I do. So I, I don't, y'all find identity in Christ and, and Christianity. I find identity in all aspects of what I do and who I am, as opposed to something like that. How would you guys like to help us get mental health resources into schools, conventions, and other events? Well, now you can. Simply go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains for as little as $1 a month. You guys can help us get mental health resources into current and upcoming generations, educate and break down stigma surrounding mental health, suicide, and depression. And you get exclusive content that you can't get anywhere else. And you guys can tell us which Nicolas Cage movie you want us to cover, and we'll do it. All it takes to get started is to go to patreon.com forward slash victims and villains, or simply click the link in the episode description wherever you guys are currently listening or streaming this episode. Pick your tier and get started today. Yes, it's that simple. So quickly select the tier that you want and help us get hope into the hands of the depressed and the suicidal today. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's, that's perfectly fine, dude. Like at the end of the day, like as long as, you know, you are content and happy with where you are and like, you know, again, I, I, I came from the culinary world too, like uh, Joe and like, again, like that world is so incredibly toxic because like if you if you reach like this level of like you know let's just call it perfection or or like you know peak form final form whatever you want to call it like your identity now becomes that job title yep. and you are constantly on the thing to where like when i was approached to run a, a small business here in richmond I had to clearly define that like when I leave this place, I I'm keeping this place here. Like this place is not following me home. It's not going on vacation with me. Uh, and that was kind of one of the very first things that like I tell people in orientation, if I'm not on the clock, you're not texting me. Right. Like bottom line. Uh, and so like that was kind of something that like I had to like learn the hard way, but yeah, it's, at the end of the day, man, like it, it's, I think Mark, you bring up a good point. Like it's, it is like all of the things that, you know, it kind of exists to, to make up the greater part of, of who you are. Yeah. And I'm in the particular job I'm in. I, I may not, that, that may not be who I am, but I, I have a hard time cutting off at five o'clock. Okay. I'm done. I still have to, check emails every now and again crap like that go but, 
go work in the food industry. That'll change real fast. Oh yeah, that that'll break you. <laughs> that habit for sure. Because oh, there oh, is man. no there is no such thing as as sick time, vacation time, anything like that. Like you you are married to the job on a nigh constant basis. Oh, at one point, what I do was like that. I actually got called on vacation and told I needed to come back early so I could go to completely another state to help out a sister company from vacation. I was like four hours away up in the mountains and got called. Yeah. You need to come back a couple days early. It's like, <laughs> what? So I, I get that. I've had to do that. I've put in 60, 70 hour weeks between emails and customers and phone calls and after hours troubleshooting. And this customer's got an emergency and it's Sunday. So yeah, I get that. I get that no, without a doubt. So I'm not as bad about it now because I refuse to be, but I still have some of those tendencies. Yeah. I, uh, I, I have to say that like this is kind of completely off topic and I don't know where it wants to fit in, but I just wanted to mention it on this podcast because this is my favorite part of the movie. I adore the scene between uh, Frankenstein's monster and the little girl Maria. It's such a, a wholesome uh, like scene that turns dark so incredibly fast and I think it goes back to, uh, you know, just the idea that like for for him, this monster, like he doesn't really understand. He doesn't know better. And like so the way that that scene develops is really interesting because he's watching Maria throw these flowers into the pond and then, you know, kind of thinks that there's no distinction between the flower and Maria and she ends up drowning. And uh, I think that's just I think it speaks volumes on needing to like the importance of research and understanding and teaching because it's the and result teaching. of the lack of teaching from Dr. Frankenstein to the monster. He never taught him any better, but the monster was held responsible for lack of knowledge. And you see some of those themes continued on into bride of, of what it means to teach this, this blank slate of, of a creature that really doesn't, doesn't know any better and and again that's that's why i think these these movies are as special as they are because they're presented in a way that allows you to 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 layer it and to understand that yeah it's there's more there's an entire buffet's ta buffet tables worth of content to talk to just talk about the man trying to play God aspect of this movie, right? There's more than enough stuff on the table. But when you look at past that point and you and you realize like but you you take the time to watch the little idiosyncrasies of the monster and you watch him learn and then fail and and then be held responsible, but then to have that response from the people be you know, fearing what they don't understand, coupled with trying to, you know, looking for vengeance and looking for blood and and how he responds to that and, and all of that. There's so much to glean as you continue to peel back the layers. And I'm glad that you brought that scene up, Josh, because I, I found myself I, I you know, on one side, uh, on one side, I had the movie going on the other side. I had my work going and I'm, I'm doing both at the same time. And I found myself during that scene in particular, stopping what I was doing over here and and paying attention to to just what's happening on the screen, because it really is compelling to watch what what is what is this 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 thing that is the size of a fully grown man but the mentality of a very young child yeah uh i i think this like this scene is like and yeah, it's really important too is like one of the things too that like we, we keep we keep talking about like the importance of like teaching and like being educated and stuff along like this is like uh i'm I'm really grateful for the experience of victims and villains because I've learned a lot in our six years here. Um, I've learned, you know, I, our black lives matter series that we did a few years ago, like taught me so much 
Um, I've learned a, a lot from my friends in the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, but also like we started victims and villains and even abyss gazing was targeted for the horror crowd specifically to educate people on mental health education and like because i feel like you know we're doing this like disservice where we're not addressing this and we're not teaching it it's become you know even for as progressive as we come be, we've become in the last 10 years there's still this lack of education and this this massive ignorance because like we don't understand uh the chemistry behind um you know mental health and, and why we we feel depression or why we you know why someone would choose to take their own lives and you know understanding the warning signs and just so much it it really does matter it really does make a uh an impact and imagine you know what would have happened if the doctor would have actually spent more time with this creation uh we would be able to absolutely you know not see the events of that play out whether you know it's a little girl drowning or you know frankenstein ultimately burning in the end the monster mental health is one of those things that's been pretty universally mi mis misunderstood neglected whatever words you want to you want to throw in there from from all manner of crowds the secular world did its fair share. The Christian world did its fair share. Different time periods did their fair share. And yes, there are other topics that also belong in that same conversation that have been pretty universally mishandled for regardless of what, what group of people that you're talking about. And now we are finally starting to advance in um, so fun facts, a lot of, uh, for, for those of you that don't know, and you may have already covered this on the, on the podcast, so feel free to, to, to stop me if this is already treading ground, but a lot of where the science came from that has been leading the charge on mental health has actually come from the concussion, uh, science community. A lot of, there's a lot of people that are coming out and saying, Okay, it's probably bad that these kids keep saying things like, "Oh, you just got your bell rung. Oh, you're just 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 br brush it off and and you'll be good in a couple of plays." And yeah, I'm not for all you sports fans out there, great, phenomenal, whatever. But I can tell you from being in the sports world that we're only now just starting to understand CTE and and brain trauma and all of those kinds of things. And and at that same token, that's really we're just starting to really care about learning those things. And I think and and a lot you're seeing a lot of that same thing out of the mental health community that that people are now because we live in the in the information age, and because this is there's more opportunity for people's voices to be heard, it's forcing a conversation. And now there are in the right hands, there's now science that backs up what what people are that it's not just about being sad. It's not just about, you know, your, you know, the the select few that that just aren't aren't, aren't right and all of that kind of stuff. And we we know now that brain chemistries are a thing, that disorders are a thing. And there's words for these things now. There's a language for it now. But but without without that. And unfortunately, a lot of this comes out of tragedy. But without yeah. that, you don't start to have the to push the the envelope. And now we're starting to see people say, "Okay, I may have got this wrong before in the past, but let me get educated and understand a couple of things." All right. Well, I think that's going to do it for us on this episode of uh, Abyss Gazing, a horror podcast. Uh, where can people find more information about systematic geekology? Uh, you can head on over to systematicgeekology.org. Our whole uh, backlog is is there. Yep. And you guys can check out the episode we did on Wes Craven. Yep. Uh, Mark, where can people follow you online? Um, 
I still need to get those pictures up on my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> but I, like I said, I'm trying to get some good ones this time. So they actually look nice. But yeah, just my uh, miniature painting stuff on Instagram, titanium juggernaut painting. You guys can follow my film journey over on Letterbox at Captain Nostalgia. You guys can follow me on TikTok at uh, Gent Ghostface, G E N T, where I'm still making Hellraiser content. I got some. Uh, <laughs> I, I got you some ideas stopped. for. You never look, stopped. Look, making I Hellraiser never stopped. Content. Never stopped making Hellraiser the content. This is true. But uh, as I am uh, staring at pinhead right here oh bro uh yeah this is this is halloween this year so um but yeah you guys can uh head over there to see hellraiser content Hel michael myers content might be coming i don't know uh it's all hellraiser content for the time being but uh you guys can follow our parent company victims and villains we're on facebook instagram twitter twitch and wherever you guys get your uh podcasts from as well until next time, remember that the longer that you gaze into the abyss, the more the abyss gazes into you.